So, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm Robin Niblett, uh, Director of Chatham House. It's my pleasure to be able to uh, have the opportunity to moderate this session, um, uh, which is uh, discussing peace and reconciliation in a multipolar world. It's a pretty big mouthful. Um, but nonetheless, I think it very much this theme is trying to get to the heart of one of the core themes of this year's uh, uh, annual meeting in Davos, um, which is to understand how changing geopolitics are affecting conflict. Uh, that's the multipolar element. Uh, but also, uh, as Klaus Schwab and others have described, this is a moment of multi-conceptual ideas. So what are the different ideas and experiences that we can find within countries that can point to uh, progress in the future? Um, we have... Uh, if I may put it, four leading figures from uh, uh, individual countries in the region that are having to deal with peace and reconciliation, and one very experienced uh, uh, minister who uh, has both worked in the field uh, dealing with peace and reconciliation, um, but is also somebody who is highly knowledgeable about the conflicts taking place in this region themselves. And they are, and I think you've all got it on your agenda, so I won't go uh, into it in any detail, but Abdullah Abdullah, the chief executive uh, of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Um, we have Sigrid Kag, the Minister for Foreign Trade and Development from the Netherlands. Uh, we have uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdulrahman Al Thani, the Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of Qatar. Uh, we have Gibran Basil, the Foreign Minister of Lebanon, and Abdul Khader Messahel, the Foreign Minister of Algeria. So, a great amount of experience uh, around this uh, table for this conversation. And uh, what I want to do. Um, uh, have a bit of a conversation amongst the group for 30, 40 minutes, uh, but do, I do want to leave time for uh, this audience that is here, many of whom know the region as well, very well, to have an opportunity to ask questions and engage in a conversation in this forum-style room that we have here. Um, and in particular then, let me uh, kick off, uh, if I may, uh, uh, with you, uh, Chief Executive, um, a little bit on the issue of peace and reconciliation in Afghanistan. Here we are some 17 years, 18 years um, after the overthrow uh, of the Taliban. And yet it would feel to many that Afghanistan is still living through um, many of the same internal contradictions and conflicts internally uh, that were present then, despite uh, uh, at least a series, two series of, of uh, elections. What is it that you feel has changed? What is it that you've learned over the last years, and certainly your time in government, uh, about the requirements internally for peace and reconciliation? What would be some of the key principles that you would put on the table from your experience in Afghanistan that we should be working with? Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Thank you for the... Uh, opportunity. Um, in Afghanistan, apart from the impact of uh, multipolar world, getting into the internal dimensions, uh, perhaps in the past 18 years, we missed some opportunities. Uh, but apart from that, it is uh, 40 years, four decades since the war is going on in Afghanistan. It's four decades since the Soviet invasion of the country. And uh, some of the, the impact of some of the uh, events of the past cannot be ruled out. For example, when the, when the Soviets withdrew from Afghanistan, then the whole world withdrew from Afghanistan because there was another situation in Europe and elsewhere. The Cold War had ended. That in itself had an impact. In the space, the vacuum was filled with ambitious um, uh, goals of uh, our neighborhood. But in the past 18 years, the main imperative inside the country, had our own system worked better, the democratic process, issues of governance, uh, and uh, uh, people's participation in the process, uh, issue of justice, uh, the rights of the people, uh, we would have been in a different uh, mm. position in situation. Mm. Uh, so the uh, internal uh, dynamics, uh, is uh, critical. The other thing is the commitment of the leadership, whether there is genuine commitment for peace and reconciliation, because in Afghanistan, successive governments uh, have tried uh, with the process. Uh, and uh, lots of ups and downs in the, in the process uh, itself. Uh, but uh, talking about uh, multi-conceptual world, 
What is not being talked about in Afghanistan or in the context of Afghanistan is the fact that uh, Taliban are asking for Islamic Emirate, which is a different type of uh, mm. ruling, mm. like uh, the religi religious scholars uh, are getting together and appointing an emir, uh, so everybody could uh, be obedient to that type of system, uh, while we embarked upon, upon a different system. So in terms of the concept, this is... But will you need to reconcile those two concepts? Are they reconcilable? Um, or is that a fundamental obstacle? The, uh, the fundamental, fundamental obstacle has been that Taliban have refused at times, and most recently as well, to sit together directly with the Afghan government and talk and discuss these issues, including the concept of governance, mm -hmm. including the issue of withdrawal of the uh, uh, troops, the American troops, or NATO. Uh, what they say is that uh, what they say is that uh, uh, we talk to the Americans uh, and the about the troop withdrawal, uh, that, uh, and we will try to be more inclusive when we when we rule again. And so I think that's the main obstacle. But I think you, by sitting around the table, one can find ways because they also have a stake in peace. Though it's a little bit, if I look at other side of it, for example, narcotics. Yeah the source of funding for the fight in Afghanistan, the emergence of Daesh, which is an, a new phenomenon, the remnants of uh, Al-Qaeda from the old days. Uh, these, these are other, other aspects. But do you have, certain, just a last point, do you have certain red lines within your government beyond which you think peace and reconciliation must not compromise? In other words, are there certain red lines where you feel you absolutely stick too, because otherwise the kind of society, the kind of country, whether it's on the rights of women, education, a, the type of country Afghanistan will become, will be one that it is not worth reconciling for. Uh, the, the point is that uh, are there any conditions for the start of the talks? No. So for getting to the, to the table, we have not put any conditions. Uh, let's sort of visualize it in a different situation. Uh, Taliban have certain ideas. We have the people. A lot has changed in Afghanistan in the past 18 years. And this is a misconception that these changes were, were imposed upon the people of Afghanistan. Yes, the support from the international community in the space that it created, it helped uh, these uh, changes. Uh, but uh, people will not go back on their rights. But let's sit together around the table and see what, what could we do if the people opted if there is a mechanism that uh, the people of Afghanistan, majority of the people, mm -hmm. opts for the way of Taliban life, uh, let's discuss it, w how we can find out. Because it's their idea that they think that it's, it's good for the people. Yeah. Do the people think that it's good for them? OK, thank you very much. Let me turn after that uh, example of, of a very live uh, dilemma in reconciliation um, to you. Um, uh, for Mr. Misahil, because I think Algeria is a very interesting uh, experience. You had, what, some 20 years ago now, I mean, one of the most brutal periods of internal violence and instability, which um, has not risen again, despite some considerable instability in the region all around you. Could you share your thoughts of the drivers of reconciliation, the drivers of stability? What, what were some of the key elements and the key lessons from Algeria? Eh bien, d'abord, je voudrais vous remercier. I should just say, sorry, the Foreign Minister will be speaking in French. Although I'm asking him, I'm giving you the time now to pick up, those of you who don't speak French, your headphones, to say that uh, he will be uh, giving his answers in French, although I'll be asking my questions in English, which is through people. So I'm just giving people a chance. Please, over to you, Foreign Minister. d'abord, je voudrais... Thank you. Could I preface my remarks by thanking you for having chosen this topic? I think it is a world of great turbulence that we now face and where the actual idea of peace and reconciliation are very important to our people and they're very important to the future of the planet. Now, you want me to talk about the experience of my country and perhaps I could start by a question that has been raised. The president, in fact, uh, asked me to look, go to the uh, Gulf countries, and it was in August uh, 2016, no, rather 2017, in fact, that I went there. And what we were looking at was the following. By which miracle you, the Algerians, 
uh, in 1997, you were about to fail as a country. And uh, this was uh, in August 2017. So those years on, so by what miracle had that come about? A study was uh, done by the um, Institute in Washington, and it said that Algeria was uh, amongst uh, the uh, saviest uh, countries in the world, and it was uh, in line with Switzerland. So how do we go from this situation of war, of a breakdown, with all those deaths, and how do we get from there to where we are today to be one of the safest countries in the world? And I said, well, simply this. We're just talking about uh, the uh, gift of people, really. It was uh, under President Bouteflika that we did this, and we did it in the three stages. Uh, first, we had a civil agreement, and uh, the policy uh, was national reconciliation, and we actually then uh, experienced peace by doing that. And uh, this meant that we then uh, created the Algeria that we have today, which is now a very safe country, and indeed, I uh, have uh, seen what happened in Scandinavia, and uh, in uh, there were the situation was uh, that uh, this was uh, a strategy that we really put in place, and it was a long-term strategy. So the first thing you need is a will to change, and uh, you need a volunteer, a, a will of the part of the people, of course. And also, you need to have a real legal basis to this. And also, you need to have popular support. And it is vital that you have that when going for reconciliation and development. And it is important to do that, not only when fighting against ter terrorism. And indeed, we actually did that using our army. The army had an important role to play. And also, there was a popular support for that. But it's not just that, though. It's not that simple. You also have to look at the strategy that was uh, where we were trying uh, to uh, anchor democracy. Now, here, there is uh, a manual, uh, the role of uh, democracy in fighting against terrorism. And the thing is that democracy was a choice that was made. It was a strategic choice. And we didn't do it just because it was in vogue. Democracy is really the antidote to extremist discourse. Because if you're not careful, it is just one discourse uh, that will be heard. And it is also what works against exclusion, to say, if you're not with me, you're against me. And uh, therefore, it is democracy that is the, the very basis for peace. And it is through democracy that this comes about. And also... We've also had a broad-based de-radicalization de policy. And this is a very important indeed when going for peace and stability, because what we tried to do is to take us away from the sphere of extremism. We worked in the mosques. And also we worked culturally as well. And we went back to our religious tenets, really. We wanted to be show solidarity. We trained imams. And it is very important, because an imam is very important. And uh, these uh, are graduates who actually work uh, their religion. These aren't charlatans we're talking about. And you also have uh, to make sure that uh, schools uh, really actually uh, teach real politics and civics. And we also have to free up the press as well to make sure that people can express themselves. And all of this has to be done lawfully, of course. So national reconciliation can only happen if we actually take ownership of it. And this is based on non-interference. So one should not interfere in other countries. It's based on that. And also ownership. That's to say, if we have a problem, it's up to us Algerians to sort it out. And also, we have to take a certain distance here. Now, uh, you uh, spoke about uh, Algerian and Mal. Now, it is based on these principles. These are three principles. 
we have now become a stable country. We've become a safer country, and it's uh, thanks uh, to that reconciliation policy that that's happened. And it's also thanks uh, to this uh, support of the citizens. And it also, we've managed to do it. We have managed to live together. We've managed to live in peace. There is this peaceful coexistence that we have now introduced into the country. And uh, on the 16th of uh, May, and this is a resolution of uh, the United Nations, which is uh, the day of uh, peaceful coexistence. That you've laid out, and I must bring other uh, speakers in as well. I think the question we'll want to come back to later on, but not for right now, is, is this period of peace in Algeria sustainable? Hopefully it is, and as I think you've put in, you've said you've put in place a number of structures there that should be able to sustain it. Um, but I'd like to come back to that issue later on, because in a way there will have to be some type of transition, uh, certainly in the presidency at some point, uh, democratically in Algeria. And it would be interesting to hear how you deal with transitions as well as this period that we've had. But I do want to bring other speakers in. Um, for Mr. Basile, I mean, we've heard here the importance of democracy. And yet when people look at Lebanon for resolving problems. Uh, it looks like democracy prevents violence, but seems to lead to uh, a, a, a gridlock in the capacity at times to govern and to bring about change in terms of the economy, in terms of infrastructure. So what, you know, what is different or what is working at the moment? What are the experiences uh, of Lebanon in terms of peace and reconciliation when it is a country that is potentially so divided uh, internally and is reflected that way in its democratic parties? You know, our, our model, thank you for the opportunity, Lebanon is very unique. Uh, maybe you cannot find another country where you have such an equity between religions and a co-partnering in, in ruling the country. So maybe here in Europe you have Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is newly formed. Uh, we are a bit similar. Uh, but again, our democracy is particularity that is consensual. <coughs> Very hard to reach among confessions, 18 mm. confessions living in, and, and sharing <coughs> the power and the government and the parliament and the presidencies. And uh, uh, this consensus, uh, once you reach it, gives you stability. But, but difficult to reach in every process, in you know, in forming a government and adopting an electoral uh, law, and there's always this anxiety that we are living internal because the system is based on religion, so everyone has to preserve its prerogatives and its role, especially in a region where the Christians still having their stronghold in Lebanon, and they believe that this is how they keep on spreading their message of tolerance. And so, and on top of this, we have our external problems coming from the fact that Lebanon has witnessed all the uh, controversial, you know, uh, historical uh, conflicts since, since ever. We had first the Ottoman Empire, with the Turks, so we have the Arab-Turkish uh, conflict. Then we pass to the Arab-Israeli conflict, which is still, uh, you know, existing fiercely. And now we are moving to the Arab-Persian conflict. And all the three are converging in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. On top of it, the clash of civilizations between Christians and Muslims, between Sunnis and Shias, so having all this together, Lebanon is still able to absorb being a bumper. Uh, Lebanon has been called the laboratory of, uh, of civilizations, of diversity. But again, now it's a, it's a bumper of all the clashes that we are uh, witnessing in the, in the region. We have reached our internal re reconciliation, but you have to keep on maintaining it because it's a dynamic that never ends. Let, let me uh, bring Sigrid Kuck in, as I'm conscious of time. I want to make sure we get as well to the issue of, of the geopolitics that are affecting the region. But you know Syria, I think, particularly well. You've traveled and worked in there, especially in your UN roles. And when you listen, especially with your former UN hat on, as well as your current role uh, in the Netherlands government, and you look, listen to these three very different experiences, what do you take away as some of the key elements for reconciliation that, that allow success versus those that, that, that limit it? Well, I think. 
There's one strand of observations that are in the realm of the obvious. The first one, of course, is you, one has to address the root causes that led to conflict or unresolved conflict. So it can be, it's usually social exclusion, political exclusion, marginalization. The toxic mix then with regional influences and militarization of a conflict. If you look at Syria, the early days, the militarization was still absent from the oppression, the answer, reaction regime. That quickly spun out of control and it became a regional conflict. But there are many other such situations. I think Lebanon has always suffered as well. And sometimes, with all due respect, the Lebanese love to import also le uh, regional influences. So there's a give and take uh, in influence, money, arms, political or the, or control. They export also. <laughs> you also export. Uh, and clientelism. <laughs> and we'll, we could come to that. Um, but so there's always a balance there. Now, but I think the, the, the basics, of course, remains root causes of unaddressed grievances. And they're often around economics, they're about power, and they're about status of minorities, be they yes or no. And in today's world, unfortunately, identity also in Europe has come to be a very toxic new element into the equation. <laughs> what could change is, I think, in the way we approach peace processes as one of the elements to arrive at the highest level of reconciliation, which ultimately is amongst <coughs> the people that are at conflict. <coughs> is to look at local situations, local dynamics, and be powerful there, uh, build, invest, look at national processes, and I think never hijack it through the old templated version we have now, and I think we don't see success in many formulas. We take it outside of the country, we run a UN process, some of them have run for decades without result, and we are too afraid, too afraid to pull the plug and say, mm -hmm. hmm, let's take a step back. What do the data tell us? How is the power dynamic shifting? I think President Trump's decision, as much as from European perspective, we were both taken by surprise. We don't agree to the same problem analysis, let alone the solution. It's interesting because it forces everybody to rethink, take stock, and come up with a better approach to unaddressed conflict situations, including the question of Syria. I think I would always like to also pay homerons, and I'll, I'll finish there in the interest of time, to Lahda Ibrahimi, who after one and a half years concluded that what his effort and engagement was around the Syria process at the time, it wasn't working. Absence of political will, still made Security Council, all those elements are still there in many other conflict situations. The Security Council's agenda is full most of the year with protracted crisis, mm -hmm. unresolved issues, mm -hmm. at best a peacekeeping operation that doesn't have a peace to keep, but is present and is there. And that should be telling us something, that our old formula as are not suited to new conflict situations. <coughs> the numbers have increased over the last decade. The nature of conflict has altered and changed. But we're going after sort of a new disease with aspirin. Mm -hmm. And I think this calls for a totally new approach a little bit more risk embracing, mm -hmm. which countries, let's say, from the European Union, I can't say we're the most risk embracing <laughs> in terms of politics. We don't like to talk to people we shouldn't be talking to that are on sanctions list, and I accept that, I respect that, but then empower others to do so to get to a result. Because we overpromise to most people in conflict situations, and we truly underdeliver. Well, I think your comment about risk embracing actually gives me a, a good segue, if you don't mind, to uh, Deputy Prime Minister Altani, because um, uh, Qatar is known for having taken some pretty risky foreign policies in uh, recent years, certainly stepping forward. And I think Qatar is certainly a country that believes it has an approach regionally to reconciliation that is quite activist, is quite involved. Could you just share from your perspective um, more the less about the internal change but the dynamics externally. In other words, to what extent can a country like Qatar play a constructive role in peace and reconciliation regionally today? It's in an awkward position with some countries allied to it, others confronting it quite severely. But with the United States, in a way, pulling back, taking a more transactional approach, it would seem that countries in the region, and I think this is what Sigrid Cargo was saying as well, are going to have to step up and play more of a role. How much scope is there? How difficult is it to play that role today? Well, thank you. Thank you, Robin, first for having me today. And uh, I would like just uh, to commend all the participants here uh, on their comments, which are, are touching really the heart of, of uh, the reality. Uh, as you have just mentioned, uh, we, are, we are living in a very complicated situation right now in the region. And Qatar 
has been uh, taken a different approach in the foreign policy, yes, and has been very successful in the past decade. And it's proven in, in, in different uh, areas of, of conflict. Uh, one of the examples is uh, Darfur, where Qatar brought peace over there. Lebanon was one of the examples when they had the disagreement, and uh, then they agreed uh, disagreement about the president, and they agreed to to elect uh, uh, the president at that time when when they had uh, Doha agreement. Uh, other uh, conflicts are Qatar is, is progressing in. One is uh, Afghanistan. And Qatar had, had uh, uh, this unique position <coughs> because of its size, its ability to move and to talk to, uh, to all the parties in, in, in the conflicts. And we try to utilize these resources and these capabilities for the good, for, for bringing peace and reconciliation for, for those countries. But if the countries themselves, they, have no, uh, uh, they are not entering and engaging these peace processes with good intentions, you cannot you cannot impose peace. Mm -hmm. You are, we are just acting as a facilitator and a, as as a mediator. But the main players are the parties of of the conflicts. What you get from the facilitator, whether it's a country or an organization, regional or sub-regional organization or international organization, is just a support. It's just a facilitation, mm -hmm. and the main process should be driven from inside. Here, what happened in, in Lebanon, when you uh, talk about a success story, because the process was driven from inside and facilitated by other uh, uh, friends and, and allies. Now, looking at it also from another perspective, when you look at those domestic conflicts, it all has a regional dimension and has geopolitical dimension. Uh, my country is, 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 uh, has this geopolitical conflict right now with three of, of, uh, of the Gulf countries, which really paralyzed the ability of the GCC to contribute for the peace and to be a force of stability as everybody expects. Because the GCC in itself, uh, it's a strength with, with its block. But if you have each country are acting separately, it has, it has, no, uh, it has no power. It has, it has nothing to do. And the GCC itself, as an organization, as a regional organization, which proved that it was the only successful model in the Arab region, unfortunately, now it appeared that it's, it wasn't successful to solve its own conflict. Mm. So also we need to look at those uh, regional mechanisms which should uh, uh, support peace and reconciliations in other countries, but also should make sure that uh, uh, these regions staying together have a clear understanding on the means of cooperation and, and the means of dispute resolutions. Uh, uh, right now, uh, we have, it's, it's more than uh, almost uh, 20, 20 months since uh, the blockade of Qatar, and nothing has been progressed, nothing, nothing has been achieved by, by the GCC as an organization. So it's, it's, it's becoming very complicated, and uh, uh, we need, as a region, we need to have an ownership, yes, but we need to act on it with good intention and good faith at the beginning. One of the criticisms that I think has been made by your GCC uh, partners uh, is, has been that openness in a way to test the limits of democracy in other parts of the Middle East. In a way, the fear is that particular parties may get into power that then end up having one man, one vote, one time, if you see what I'm saying. So, um, and yet democracy is not something that at least in the terms that I understand it is practiced in Qatar. So to what extent uh, is there going to have to be different horses for different courses, different options? And what credibility, though, can a country like Qatar bring to the table when, in a way, it is recommending a form of reconciliation that is highly different to the one that it applies domestically? Is that element of contradiction just we're going to have to live with the diversity? And maybe diversity is what we need across the region. Does it uh, limit your capacity to carry out this foreign policy? Well, uh, it's not. First of all, Qatar has never promoted that Qatar is a force of change by imposing democracy or others. What we are promoting, what the, what the people want in those countries, that Qatar supports. 
And Qatar in itself is not, not a democratic country, yes, but it's progressing toward a people participation in, uh, in the power, and it's not like standing like stand still. And I, uh, uh, for me, if I want to apply a democracy, it doesn't mean that I have to apply specifically the democracy model in the West that will work uh, uh, in our countries and with our culture. Each country has its own culture and has its own way that democratic means can be adopted uh, in. And Qatar, this is, this is uh, the policy uh, has taken from the beginning. We have started a reform process where people participated, first of all, in the draft on, on voting on the constitution, then uh, in, in, in introducing the democratic practice by municipality councils, elections, and women participation from the first election, then uh, preparation for parliamentarian election, free media, a lot of other means of democracy are there in Qatar and, and practiced every day, but it's not called a democracy, yes. But what Qatar <coughs> adopted as a policy from the beginning when it comes uh, uh, to the region, we stood against leaders who oppressed their people. That's what Qatar did. Yeah. During the Arab Spring, Qatar uh, taken a position that's supportive of the people. And this position wasn't taken like uh, uh, when the presidents or the head of those states or those authoritarians are, are uh, not taking any action uh, or not conducting any violence against their own people, we didn't start until those, those leaders has uh, conducted violence uh, against their own people. Thank you, no uh, points uh, taken. Let me come back and just switch the conversation now just with a, a few questions about the changing geopolitical environment in which you're operating because here we have uh, Qatar hosting, I think as of yesterday, again, the next series of meetings between the Taliban and the United States. I think it's, it's underway already. Today Still underway well. today as well. I think so. Um, uh, and I just wanted to get your impression from your uh, position at the heart of, of government in Afghanistan. Um, is there a different group of players now having to play a role? Uh, are you seeing the Gulf as more important partners or equally important partners to the United States? Is there a more competitive environment? Is Iran playing a more active role uh, in Afghanistan at the moment in the past? How is the change in geopolitics changing the prospects for peace in Afghanistan? Quickly, just a quick, your nutshell viewpoints nutshell, on this. Yeah. Well, a big nutshell. Yeah, a big nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, Afghanistan has gone through different phases in a, in a uh, bipolar world, Cold War, then sort of unipolar world, and now multipolar. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to, uh, of course, because it is multipolar world, we cannot do away with the things that we need to do inside the country. We not address poverty, unemployment, and certain other things. Uh, the things will not come from, from outside. And the, the other reality is that as long as the powers in the region, uh, they play a zero-sum game, uh, it's, it's only an opportunity for those who do not believe in peace mm. and uh, uh, pursue their own uh, uh, extremist terrorist agendas. Uh, we have also been witness to that. Uh, and uh, the other issue is the presence of sanctuaries uh, in in our case, in yeah. one particular uh, country. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's a unique situation. Well, we, when we started in 2001, there was a lot of convergence of interest, mm -hmm. the way that it was perceived in, uh, and uh, dealt with by countries of the regions, powers, uh, uh, world powers, and in, in altogether. <coughs> uh, that situation has changed, and that is, uh, uh, and there is another reality as well. For example, Russia has a different position today. Iran has slightly different from Russia, but still a different position. Yeah. Pakistan has made sure that things will continue. Uh, the Taliban uh, making uh, headways in Afghanistan, if it happens, uh, then uh, of course it will hurt Central Asian republics. Mm. And it will directly hurt the uh, uh, interest of Russia, but because of other issues that they have in Europe and other yeah. places, so that's not such a 
looked such a priority, but it will come come to us. So they could almost live with a balance of power inside Afghanistan. Balance of power in power politics. Which doesn't help with, with the reconciliation. Obviously. It doesn't help with the, with the, the reconciliation. It's, it's, it's the opposite. And also when it comes to the United States and its policy towards Afghanistan, uh, the uh, consistency uh, and uh, coherence of that policy uh, is important. Uh, if it is uh, one day that we, we don't talk uh, to, uh, to, to the Taliban and we shouldn't talk to the Taliban. Nobody should talk to the Taliban. And one day is that the only way forward is the, to talk to the Taliban and let's withdraw. Uh, this, these are the, the conditions that uh, a country like Afghanistan, which I mentioned at the beginning, has gone through 40 years of how much more we can, we can take. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, it's, uh, it looks like a wishful thinking. To, to bring back countries on the basis of the realities that at least in the midterm and lo long term, terrorism, extremism is not in their interest. So that, that will be the key. Um, if I may turn uh, to Ms. Sahel, uh, for Mr. Ms. Sahel, um, Algeria had the luxury, one could argue, of not having that external interference as it went through its process of, as you said, getting over 200,000 dead. I mean, a really brutal period. In a way, um, do you think that you were uniquely lucky in not having that external interference, or was, uh, were, I don't know, support with the fact that you had a, a good economic relationship then with uh, European Union, with your neighbor to the north, what's been different, uh, and what lessons have you had that can then be applied to others? Or is it that Algeria was in a unique situation? I think uh, what is a particularly characteristic of our situation is, well, our history, the history that we had gone through uh, over the centuries. Uh, we had uh, something which was very fundamental uh, to us, and I think this has been proven throughout history. So uh, we are very allergic uh, to external interference. We don't like people interfering in our affairs. And we would never interfere in anyone else's, uh, and we would never agree to anyone coming in. Okay, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Now, we don't like people interfering in our affairs, and this is uh, an underlying principle for us. And I said, we are the basis of our diplomacy is uh, basically a three pronged approach. First, this non interference, and we would not accept this, and we would not do it to others. The second is that we uh, keep our distance. We are very careful. Now, I uh, have uh, I s spoke to Russian. I'm going to be in Washington next week. Um, uh, basically, I have a good relationship with Europe. Uh, so basically, uh, we don't come down on any particular side. And we see this equidistance, as we call it, as something as a fundamental importance as well. And it is part of uh, the independence of decision making. And it's not always easy in this world. And also, now, we uh, have a border of a thousand kilometers with Libya, but uh, there is a, not a single soldier from Algeria in Libya, and not a single bullet has gone into that country. There is no country company that's gone in. Now, we talk about solutions that come from the outside, and everyone can make a contribution to that, uh, but uh, we would be against uh, ideological, military, or economic, or political confrontation, because there are certain vested interests, of course, and I think we have to face up to that. So, and I think we have to see the situation that country is in. And uh, if you look at Libya, that uh, is something that you see in other regions as well. And now, uh, why are there these problems in Libya sort of against women, for example? And uh, I would, uh, I know the country, and I've been to the country, and in fact I've covered the country from Easter to West. I'm one of the few who's done that. And, uh, and it was San Salabi who did it. I went to the East, and I went to the North, uh, and uh, there are even uh, Libyan uh, leaders who can't do the trip that I did. Now, amongst the Libyans, uh, people want to get out of the situation that they're in, and they are, are amazing uh, people. Uh, we have trained, educated women, and uh, they can get through this, uh, but I think we have to let them get on with it. We have to uh, allow them to sort out their own problems, and uh, that is the basis here. Now, uh, there was a certain amount of slippage uh, during the 1990s because uh, there were Algerian uh, leaders 
who wanted to try and uh, solve our problems from the outside, and that was rejected by the people. So uh, basically, ownership is very important, and it is absolutely essential. And the same way it goes to the Sahel as well in, in all our regions. Interference has happened, and others have become involved. It becomes very difficult to put it back together again. Comment je pas comprendre attendez. Si si on alors si si quelqu'un a so, if someone has intervened in your country from the outside, it's very difficult to, to uh, actually uh, make that good again. Algeria has, uh, didn't have that experience. Well, now, now, interference isn't just military, it can be ideological interference. Uh, we had the integrationists, for example. And now, uh, now, uh, we went off to Afghanistan to, to fight against communism at the time, and uh, they came back through the Chechen and uh, Bosnia, and, and uh, there are a number of uh, who uh, came into Algeria. So uh, there's, you can have ideological interference as well, and uh, we uh, suffered that. And uh, it is uh, by uh, taking ownership of our own Islam uh, that we're able uh, to deal with this. and. Uh, it is a moderate Islam. And now it's important that we allow people uh, to uh, resolve their own problems. Now, Syria started with a small demonstration in a town. And this then became a domestic problem, and then it became an international problem, and now it's brought in Russia and the United States. And this started with a simple demonstration. So, and now I'm saying this uh, with the Lebanese minister here present, in the, uh, now, Syria is uh, was a great place uh, for coexistence. There, it was a great, and uh, this uh, was uh, had worked well there. Now, Mr. Kawa, who was Jewish, and is what deed, and so all of that was part of that culture. And what is fragmentation, uh, particularly? when it becomes uh, from a religious source. They'd resisted the Ottomans, against, they'd resisted the French, uh, the British colonialists, uh, and uh, so they'd lived together. And uh, then it just broke down. To, uh, from hey, in a nutshell again? Or, or? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how the nutshells go. Um, we've, uh, well, what I do want to do is actually get uh, some questions in a second. And I'm sure I'm going to call a few questions after from Sir Basile and then let you both answer them first, because that way I'll give equal amount of time to everyone. But just on Syria specifically, what do you see um, as the next steps? Because uh, at the moment, certainly, I think uh, your government is trying to find a way to think about uh, if President Assad has, in essence, won the civil war, there has to be a way to find some type of reconciliation. Is that the position at the moment of the Lebanese government? Is that what you're working towards? And do you think that's going to work, given the amount of external powers that have quite different views uh, on that future? Yeah, it's, uh, it's again trying to export the model of Lebanon, because uh, we exported the alphabet, the commerce, uh, uh, and we imported the problems, we had our war. We used to talk of the Balkanization of Lebanon. Now after we found our reconciliation, we're talking of the Lebanization of the Balkans, the Lebanization of Iraq, and now the Lebanization of, of Syria. Doesn't mean that our model in ruling is successful, but our model in the co-living and the coexistence is still holding. Yeah. Despite that we are on an, the most challenging, uh, you know, for humanity now is the ability to, to live together. We are having the, for example, the Lebanese model, which is the antidote of terrorism and the anti-model of monolithic societies like Israel, which is on our side causing us the problems. So we are having both terrorism, mm -hmm. extremism, mm -hmm. that is reflected in groups like, like Daesh and mm -hmm. Taliban and, uh, and Nusra, and in states, mm -hmm. like in our case, Israel. So not, not easy to find stab stability among uh, all this. And it is mainly because of our culture, our ability to absorb, <coughs> to adapt, to bear with su such major problems. But again, the, the interferences, 
Lebanese like to bring interferences, you know, uh, maybe again in culture, because this is how, how is our society, Convivialité. you know, East and West, <laughs> and, uh, you know, yeah, sure, we, we can absorb everything. But a, again, being neutral is not really po possible because of the interferences. Mm -hmm. And trying to spread our, our uh, tendency towards equilibrium is not easy because it's changing with demography, exactly. with uh, rapport de force, Democra uh, demography, economy, military. So that's why it's a changing uh, dynamics always and stopping others from interfering into our society is not so easy. So mainly it is our target is to have a stable Syria, secular again. Because we believe that mm -hmm. uh, secular state is the answer to all our problems in diverse societies. But we are faced with what? With uh, attempts always to create division and to have states, monolithic states in our, in our region colliding mm -hmm. like steel balls together, colliding each other all the time instead of melting together like the melting pot of Lebanon. Look, let me, let me get a few questions in. I will give an opportunity to, to Sigrid and, and um, Saltani to come in. Who would like to uh, post some questions first to our audience here? Otherwise, we'll certainly be able to carry on our conversation. We've got a lot more to talk about, but I do give, want to give an opportunity in the last 10 minutes. Anyone want to come in? No, oh, everyone is... That's right. Oh, thank you. Right, uh, lady first, gentleman there first, please, and then... Thanks. Um, I was... Uh, the, the analysis uh, just given about uh, Syria with respect to uh, having uh, survived so long and then now uh, seeing sort of a cleansing or, or a homogenization. Um, part of this is uh, global warming, the, the droughts. Is this correct? Is that the right analysis? Is that part of the problem? I'll bring that into question. Gentlemen, if you pass the microphone just in front of you. I think there's a gentleman there, and then I'll go to the back there. Yeah. Thank you very much, Khaled Janahi. Uh, in the era of Trump and his tweets and Bolton and Kushner, uh, would United States be a true reconciling broker, peace broker, uh, that we see what's going on? And specifically, actually, that's to Sheikh Abdurrahman. And with what's going on, what you said about the Gulf and Qatar and the other countries, I mean, the easiest part is, and I know the answer is going to be, we are willing to sit. They are not willing to sit. But why are we not going the extra mile and really going forward and getting this thing sorted out? Because the problem in the region is substantial, what's going on with that. And it could affect other areas, not just what's going on. I mean, eventually, eventually we'll have being from the region. The governments will be peaceful together. I have families in Qatar. Others have families in Bahrain and elsewhere. So we're having, as people, we're having a problematic issue in terms of solving this thing out where it could be sat with these guys sitting across the table and sorting it out. Thank you. If you pass the microphone back there and I'll come down here to Mark. My question is to the Minister of Algeria. I understand very well out of the three points, the non-interference, the equidistance, as a Swiss parliamentarian, it's <laughs> very obvious. I have more difficulties to see how you organize appropriation. If in a country you have two or three tribes, or if you have different political opinions or different interests, how do you manage to create a national appropriation? Right. Good. So that'll be a question we'll come back to you on. Yeah, Mark here. Uh, microphone here. And then one here, and that'll be the last one. Sorry. One, two, and then we'll finish. More questions? I'd love to hear any thoughts on the role of uh, cultural heritage and how the shared cultural heritage in the region can help bring people together to find some high level of peace. Thanks. Great. And yeah, just Hello. My name is Fursan Hussein. I'm a Palestinian citizen of the state of Israel. And my, you know, I have family all over the Arab world. Um, I cannot visit them. And my question is, I think the time has come for us to do something really drastic. I see a bright Middle East if we all cooperate and resolve this issue. And you know, if we're willing to sit down with terrorists, that we might as well also, you know, willing to be sit down with, you know, with a country that exists that will never go anywhere. And really, what is the right strategy to move this conflict and really address the big elephant in the room? That was a nice easy one to get at the end. So I'm not sure who I'm going to give that particular question to. But, but let me um, 
Uh, I'm going to start, uh, if I may, uh, Sidri Kak for Mr. Uh, Development Minister Kak. Um, uh, on the issue, perhaps you know Syria well. If you could say maybe a word on Syrian climate change. Now, I, mean, I don't know how much you know it that well, but you may have a view as to how uh, intrinsic the move to urban cities and away from the rural areas were in that. But I think to all of the questions and to everyone, I'd love to hear your view on this as well. The issue whether Trump can be a, a reconciler um, as well would be interesting to hear your views on that. Any other points you'd like to pick up? Because this probably will yeah. be the last round yeah. of, of comments. No, I, I can do it very briefly. When I was uh, in charge of the uh, elimination of the declared Syrian chemical weapons program, I confess I wasn't busy with climate change, but I know climate change is one of the root causes of many conflicts. That's why I said exclusion, marginalization, access, corruption. A war economy also breeds a whole new so-called elite that often comes to power successively. In many countries and conflict situations, we need to be very mindful of that. Second part is identity, cultural heritage. I think extremely important, mm -hmm. particularly in reconciliation, but given it equal weight. And again, you can't mm -hmm. have a hierarchy of identities. Look at Europe, presumed to have been so stable. Populism are hijacking identity. It's changing. It's become a negative instrument or it can be a force for good. So hence, coexistence needs to be nurtured and invested. Third point I'd like to make is youth. Mm. This region, all countries, young people are isolated, feel unheard, are not part of any particular process. I won't even address the elephant in the room to my mind, women at the table, mm -hmm. but I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> uh, but the women of your countries, of course, are also not at the table. The Syria process, Libya process, Yemen process, Western donors finance their participation. Where are they? In a back room advising the UN envoy. They have to be at the table, 50% of the population. Transformation out of conflict is recognizing inequality and inequity. It's not rocket science most of the time. Very much commend the power to having it people-led with help from outside where appropriate. I think Oman hasn't been mentioned. I think partly because they've been so discreet and effective and don't want much out of it other than truly stability and solutions that can be facilitated. And I think uh, last but not least, civil society as a whole, again as the countervailing force, <coughs> new voices, new players. In many countries, they're seen to be a sector. They are not. They need to be given voice. And I'm looking at Angela Kane from the, uh, from the Dialogue Advisory Group, but also Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. Mm -hmm. So many of the track two, track three processes that also involve private sector create jobs, create hope and perspective to sort of address the issues when you want to have the day after. Many days after never come because we don't invest from the outset in a political process, which a lot of the time is socio-economic mm -hmm. with politics riding over it. I mean, I think we, we ignore that to our peril. Hence, climate change is not addressed. Mm -hmm. And we'll see many series of new conflicts and they're not difficult to predict. They're happening under our very eyes. Well, I think it'll be interesting to see the role that Europe, uh, which, will, which will experience the spillover of all of these effects if we don't deal with them uh, uh, quickly, whether Europe, as you said earlier, could play a slightly more forward-leaning yeah. role in this or not. Um, Promise Altani, maybe to you quickly on, there was a comment about uh, whether you still think the United States, uh, Trump can be a, a reconciler or not at this point. Well, uh, Just a quick comment. I'm looking at time. We've got four minutes uh, for four people. Uh, no so. problem. I'll try my best. <laughs> for the four mm. of us. <laughs> uh, re regarding the U.S. role and uh, can it be a reconciler for in the region? Yes, they they still can be a reconciler in the region because they are partners or, and and ally of most of the countries in in our region. I'm not talking specifically about the GCC here, but I'm talking about the bigger. Uh, regional conflicts, whether it's what's happening in Syria, whether what's happening in Libya. U.S. is, is a superpower in the world. It's a fact over there. And uh, with the absence of uh, the, the enforcing mechanism uh, from the United Nations, you have to, uh, those superpowers need to use their influence in order to impose peace and, and reconciliation. Uh, second, regarding the GCC uh, conflict and why Qatar doesn't go the extra mile I think uh, uh, our brother uh, Khalid from Bahrain, uh, uh, if you will look back since the start of the crisis, Qatar has gone twice the extra mile while the other countries were un unwilling to sit. And Qatar remained with its p position despite the hostility uh, which it's been subject to. 
and uh, we tried our best that to isolate this crisis from the people because, uh, because we have interconnected families that they are allowed uh, to come to Doha without any procedure. They shouldn't apply. They are not, uh, 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 they are not forced to uh, submit a proof that they have a relative over there in Qatar. And there is plenty of uh, GCC citizens, among them from the blockading states, are entering Qatar back and forth. And I won't report their names I, I, because I don't want them to be captured in their countries. Thank you very much. Uh, Abdullah Abdullah, what would you say at the end on some of the key uh, takeaways you want people to take from this panel, from your experience in Afghanistan? Um, uh, you know, more uh, uh, in engagement externally, if you see what I'm saying, from a more diverse group of actors? Or, you know, is it really up to Afghans themselves in the end to be able to find the reconciliation? No, the, uh, the end state is up to the Afghan people, but look yeah. at the conditions. Uh, can we do it at this stage? Today, absolute majority of the people of Afghanistan want peace. Yeah. But what are the conditions then? Yeah. So, how we can, we can reconcile different interests with the very rigid uh, positions of the countries around us and beyond us. Could there be an economic answer? Just quickly, this uh, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, things like that, could that yeah, make the these, difference? These, these, these are, in spite of all the things that, that was underway, these projects like Kaza 1000, the TAPI, which is gas project, TAP, which is electricity project, and others, and also our active participation in the regional, uh, regional uh, um, uh, institutions, uh, this will help. Uh, at the same time, uh, fundamental decision has to be made by a few countries that in the midterm and long term, this is not in their interest. Yeah. In the immediate term, the continuation of the conflict might suit some ideas, some uh, thinking, but not in the midterm and long term. Thank you. I'm going to come. I'm going to finish with you, sir. Last on the appropriation, because you had a very specific question. But uh, uh, unfortunately, there's one question that hasn't been answered as well here, apart from climate change issue on Syria, which is: Is it time to to be bold on the uh, uh, Arab-Israel uh, set of conversations? The question that was asked here. What would be your position uh, and your answer? There's always time for peace, but you need two to tango. Uh, culture is the basis of everything. Hmm. I believe that time is now for the return of refugees, time is for the reconstruction of Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Libya, uh, because bidding on the fact that forcing this movement of people is causing the cultural clash, which is causing also the Western extremism here, and you see the rise of it and the reaction of it uh, in our region. And the displacement now of fighters using them from various, from a place to another uh, and uh, creating killing zones for them is actually creating more breeding of violent, uh, violent people. So I believe that uh, we should all be convinced that we cannot have economic globalization while having cultural is isolation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A good line, and I'm sure Davos will pick that one up later on. Um, for Mr. Sahel, for you, there was a very specific question about uh, uh, appropriation and whether it's possible to do that, um, and whether that, you know, that was the challenge, I think, to you for that question. If you could finish just one minute on appropriation. Yes, it is uh, both precise, but it's also very apposite. Now, this is uh, the basis of so appropriation. What do we mean? We mean that uh, there should be a dialogue and reconciliation, and people have to buy into that. So uh, the uh, problems of Algeria have to be sorted out by Algerians without uh, any uh, exclusion. That is uh, to say, everyone has to sign up to this. There has to be a national uh, debate, and uh, the future of the country concerns all Algerians, both uh, young people, women, and indeed, uh, I'm going to be uh, visiting uh, next month, and I'm going to uh, um, make presentations there in your country. So I'll be uh, very happy that I'll be in your country. But uh, women al in Algeria at the very centre of this ownership, and we're talking about a Muslim country. Forty percent of our judges uh, are women, 
and it is women who administer justice. In education, uh, more than 65% uh, are women. In medicine, uh, we would uh, say most doctors are women. Uh, and uh, I was uh, in communication, uh, and 60% of journalists are women. So uh, women have an extraordinary role to play. And uh, this is because of our history, and we are now very much involved, all of us, in building a new Algeria. Uh, but uh, basically, w women are the future of man, are the future of the country. President as well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Not to that extent. I don't think I don't know how quickly that one went up. But let me just say, I'm, I'm not going to try to, to wrap up like such a complex <laughs> conversation, but I, I do want to thank <laughs> our five panellists for both looking inside their countries and talking about the external environment as well in a very disciplined way. And I hope you picked up uh, uh, some of the gems that came from each of them through the course. So a big, strong hand for our panel. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.